Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Hillside. If you're here on site or if you're joining us online, we are just, uh, we're always so excited to have you with us uh, today. And we trust that you've been enjoying uh, the interviews. That one was an amazing one. And I've been thinking about French fries all weekend now. And so when we get out of here, Yvonne, we've got to find a place somewhere. We've got to go somewhere to score some French fries. And not the ones baked in the oven either, the really good ones. But I digress. So welcome here today. So glad that you have joined us uh, this morning. So I don't know if you've ever uh, faced much opposition uh, in your life. Uh, I'm not sure if there was ever something in your life you felt to, to do or you just wanted to do and the people around you for some reason chose to oppose you. Oftentimes uh, when we were kids, at least when I was a kid, uh, many of us thought that it was our parents' only desire in life to stand against the fun uh, that the kids wanted to have. And then for some of us, we became parents ourselves. And we learned that uh, our parents' opposition to something that we wanted to do was oftentimes rooted in them trying to protect us from something bigger that we didn't understand. So confession is good for the soul. So I try to do it in front of at least 100 people every week. From a very young age, I always had this inner desire that I wanted to be a ninja. Yes, a ninja. And probably explains why at 46 years old, I'm still taking karate lessons only now with my family a couple nights a week, uh, but I digress. When I was six or seven, seven or eight, somewhere in there, uh, to help facilitate my dreams of wanting to be a ninja, my mother brought, bought me a karate suit. Well, it was kind of a karate suit. It was like the, the jacket of a karate gi and, and the pants and stuff of a karate gi and, and the belt. And it was amazing. A uh, small kid in small town Newfoundland, I was the only person in my community at that point that had a karate gi. And so I looked the part, but it definitely wasn't the part. But so amazing was this, that I didn't want to just confine my new ninja identity inside of the house. No, no. I wanted the neighborhood to know. I wanted my friends to know. I wanted everyone to see <laughs> that I'd become a ninja in my own right. But my mom said no. She said no. She opposed my vision for my young, growing life. <laughs> and the reason why she said no was something that I didn't know. But the reason why she said no was because the karate suit that she bought me was actually a pajama set. It wasn't a real karate suit. And she didn't tell me. But a persistent person never gives up on a vision, ever especially a young boy with dreams of being a ninja and who has a karate suit to show off and public places to make that vision a reality. So one day when mom was unaware, I donned the karate gi and made my way to the most logical place to unveil my new identity to all my friends, my local school. <laughs> Needless to say, when a kid shows up to school in pajamas and it's not pajama day, there's no black belt that can spare them from the mockery that they're about to receive. And when that child gets home from school, there is no black belt on earth that's going to protect them from the wrath of mother that is about to come. Opposition to an improbable and unlikely dream. Happens to the best of us. Uh, but just for the record, most times, mother knows best. Most times. So there we go. So... Here we are today, back in our series that we have called Regather, Vision, People, Movement. And we're talking about how, how we think about calling and purpose and, and movement in our own individual lives. After a couple years of where we've kind of been that's felt kind of stagnant, felt kind of isolated, felt kind of insular, maybe more than we have ever before. People and organizations and churches are, are trying to find their way again in mission, on mission, in response to what's been a couple of years where stuff has been probably more focused inward than we have for some time. So for this teaching series, we've been looking into the book of Nehemiah, which is a book found in the Old Testament if the Bible is not something that you're really familiar with. But it talks about how God gives a person and a group of people a vision towards regathering people and movement and how all that stuff works as we try to move our way forward. 
Over the last couple of weeks, uh, we saw how this vision came to Nehemiah from a family relative, uh, that the, the walls of Jerusalem were, were broken down. The need got into his ears, as we heard, and then moved into his heart. He was broken about it. And then he went and experienced the brokenness for his own self. And then he, along with many others, did something about this to get this wall rebuilt. And all of these talks so far led to a series of questions that we've been asking over the course of the last couple of weeks. So the questions have moved from, uh, what needs in your world break your heart? First question. Then we move to, uh, what needs in your world will break your heart enough that you'll actually move to experience that brokenness? And then we ask the question about, what needs in this world? What thing that needs to be rebuilt in this life? What is that thing that you want your name to be inscribed on? Not that you would own it, but that it would be inscribed on it. You were part of it. You were there. It's a good question. And that's where we've been. That's the quick recap. I recapped uh, about two and a half hours of preaching in about three questions. So there you go. So, so that's where we've been. And if you want to look back on any of that stuff, please check out our YouTube channel. We'd love for you to hit that up and check out some of that stuff from the last uh, few weeks, for sure. Because I do believe that God has been speaking to us on some of these things. And today we are going to look at what happens when you're trying to gather together personal vision for your life, for your family, for your career, for your ministry, and things don't go as planned. Guess what? It's going to happen. The passage that Laura Lynn read for us uh, this morning shows that there was some definite opposition that arose uh, to Nehemiah and friends when they planned to rebuild uh, this wall. There were two guys in this story. Their names, who knows how to pronounce them? I'll take my best crack like Laura Lynn did. Uh, I'm going to say Sanballat and Tobias. And even the name Sanballat sounds diabolical, doesn't it? just got that ring to it, doesn't it? Of all the biblical names that I've heard over the years that people have used to name their kids, I've never heard anybody yet name their kids Sanballat. I think maybe for a good biblical reason here in this text. But if you do have that name, I apologize. It's a great name. I'm not sure if you've had someone in your life ever stand against you in this way or ever oppose you in this way to your face or behind your back. But I can assure you of one thing. It's not a good feeling. I can attest to that feeling. I've been there. And likely, because of what I do with my life, I'm likely going to be there again. I've got the t-shirt. It's in the closet. I would like for it to stay there. But there's a chance that it won't. A high chance that it will probably come back out a few more times in my lifetime. But a quick look at this story reveals a few things that maybe you've experienced as you've dealt with opposition in your own life. When Sam Ballot heard the wall was being rebuilt, we read these words. It says, he became furious and very angry. Depending on what translation you read, that is a very rich passage. So, just for the record, if you've never at this point had someone in your life angry with you, then I'm envious of you, uh, that I wish I were you. Uh, because somewhere along the way in this life, there will probably be someone who will be angry with you? In this text, Sam Ballot was furious. The, the Hebrew actually reads like flaming nostrils kind of mad with this whole situation. So if you've never had someone angry with you yet or furious at you yet, then I can say with all sincerity of heart, I'm happy for you. You've lived a pretty blessed life so far. But these days, you don't need to do a whole lot to get someone furious. You don't need to do a whole lot to get someone angry with you at all. All you need to do, you could do it right now. You could take out your phone. You could put a post on one of your socials, and you've got the world coming down on you faster than you can click those buttons. Our world has become an increasingly more angry place. So don't be surprised if maybe your good motives or something you were trying to do that was good kind of backfires and someone lashes out angry at you or furious, guess what? You won't be the first. It'll hurt a lot, but you won't be the first, and you won't be the last. The story continues. He became furious and was very angry 
and mocked the Jews. What are these feeble Jews doing? Can they finish this thing like in a day? Who do they think they are? I don't know if you've ever had anybody angry with you. That's for you to figure out, and I assume you already know. But I know another thing. Have you ever had anybody mock you? Have you ever been mocked? Have you ever had someone seriously mock you? Being mocked is a unique experience, and unfortunately I can say I lived through that one too. It's a very childish thing. It comes from a very childish posture and comes from a very immature place. And the thing about mockery is this. It's super easy to become angry when someone is mocking you. So difficult. So hard to be composed and be the bigger person and to walk away when someone is actively mocking you. The mockery actually makes fun of a person, doesn't it? Makes fun of someone, insults their intelligence, insults their intellectual ability, insults their ability to carry out through on something. S something that unfortunately comes around sometimes when someone chooses to stand against you because of a stand you are taking or because of a, a vision that you are believing for or for a cause you feel to invest your life in. It happens. And if it hasn't happened yet, I'm happy for you. But if you ever get a vision, hold on. This may come your way. Happened to Nehemiah and can happen to you. Here's the thing. <laughs> this mockery is often dripping, absolutely soaked and drenched in. Well, let me see if you can finish my sentence. Here's a, if you're watching online today, maybe you can use the chat and put this in a bit of a contest. I'm going to read a verse and I want you to kind of uh, see if you can see what this verse is dripping in. And then you can write it in the chat, and you can have a little contest on your own. And if the winner wants to uh, ask somebody else in the chat to take you out for lunch, feel free to do it, as long as you take me along too. All right? This is what we're going to do. So here's the next verse. See if you can determine, based on the context here, what this verse is dripping in. Now we see this. It says, Now Tobiah the Ammonite was near him, Sambala, and said, Even what they are building, if a fox were to jump on it, Surely it would even break that stone wall down. The mockery that people will often use to derail personal gathering or regathering of vision is often dripping in. Can anybody here finish it? Let's go. Sarcasm. Sarcasm. Boy, it didn't take us very long to figure that one out, did it? If you're online, maybe you've won the contest. Congratulations. I hope you get a great lunch out of that today, and you can thank me for it. So take me out, by the way. Montana is always good. So back to this. Sarcasm. Many of you have experienced sarcasm. I would even go as far as to say is that some of you have even experimented using sarcasm. <laughs> this expression of language actually comes from the Greek word sarkos which translates into the English word flesh. And the whole word sarcastic, sarcasm, comes from a Greek root that means to devour the flesh. To devour the flesh. It's an interesting word. Sarcasm digs so hard and is meant to wound. And it wounds in a way that lots of other things don't. By the way, uh, I need to say this for the record. I'm going to put it out there because I'm a pastor. And I try to keep the biblical as much as I can. But just in case you don't know, church, sarcasm is not, hear me, it's not a fruit of the Spirit. It is not. It is not. It has never been. It has never been a part of the character of Jesus that Jesus wants to form in us. But that's a different series and sermon for another day. I'm not going to go too far down there. But just to be clear, you heard it here first. Breaking news. All of these things... When we are kind of opposed uh, with anger and fury and mockery and sarcasm, these things are extremely detrimental to us embracing the vision that we've been given and moving it forward in our lives. Because these tactics are all meant, every single one of them are meant to intimidate you and to create fear and doubt and discouragement. These things, hear me, they're meant to trigger everything but faith. They're meant to trigger everything but faith. 
when someone comes with anger and they're mocking you and their sarcasm and all that stuff, those things are meant to trigger doubt, fear, discouragement, all that stuff in you. They are not meant to trigger faith, and they never, ever do trigger faith. And it's an unfortunate reality uh, to consider as we think about it. Vision, big things, big dreams, fixing broken situations. Just for the record, for those of you that have been involved in those stories, they rarely ever go smoothly. Rarely ever do they materialize into the dream that you dreamt about the night you fell asleep. There's always things in the middle that you've kind of got to work through. And it's wise to know that one has to be prepared for these things when you begin to step into anything uh, that God is calling you into. When you begin to step into these things, this will be part of the territory. It's always been. And so there are a couple things here that we, we do need to process around fear and faith. Fear and faith. Because it's in these moments where a vision for your life, if you're a note taker, I, I love note takers. I know many of you are mental note takers. But if you write stuff down, write this down. It's in these moments where a vision for your life either gets deeper traction or comes off the rails completely. It's in these moments where that vision that you have for your life, for your marriage, your relationships, your work, your career, your ministry, it's in these moments of opposition where your vision either goes down deeper or comes off the rails completely. These are important moments. We're gathering a vision, movement, people, or whether we're building up something broken, either gets moved ahead or gets tossed aside. And it's here. The choice is clear. And we've all got to make it. Stop in our tracks in fear or move ahead relentlessly in faith. It's your choice to make. We all need to make it at some point in our lives when God calls us to a broken wall. Thankfully, Nehemiah chooses to move ahead relentlessly in faith in despite of all these things. But it's not easy for him, and it's not easy for those that are working alongside of him. Let's look at how this opposition gets handled as I begin to bring this down uh, to a conclusion today. The Bible says, Nehemiah's prayer, Hear, O God, hear how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads, and give them up for plunder in a land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and don't let their sin be blotted out before you because they've demoralized the builders. You ever been demoralized before? You know what that feels like? <laughs> People who often give their lives to building walls feel this. Feel that opposition and it's just it's demoralizing sometimes. So Nehemiah, what does he do? Takes this to prayer. Immediately first to prayer. Notice the sequence. Uh, there's no committee. There's no action plan, no, re no revisiting the strategic plan. Uh, there's no Google search. There's no Facebook group. He turned to God and laid it out. God, in the midst of our despise, be our defender. And, and there may be some of you today, whether you're here in the room or you're watching this online, that you need to back up and deal with some of these things that are going on in your life, deal with them with prayer first. Trusting that, that God is going to be your defender and your strength and your vindication and your help in time of trouble. Because you know what? I'll tell you what I do. It's easy to first send the email to the opposition. <laughs> That's the easy first thing to do. Or send the tweet in defense of what you did. <laughs> or put a statement out on your Instagram. Child of God, please hear me. <laughs> In the face of opposition uh, to a vision that God's given you in your life for any area of your life, get on your face first and pray. Give it to God first. I promise you, it's a good model to take because we see it in the Bible. That's the place where it all starts. It might sound a little cliche and old-fashioned, and if it does, I'm sorry I'm guilty for that today. But finding encouragement through God in prayer is more proven than finding it through sending emails and posting defenses on the internet to defend yourself. There is something tweetable, maybe for later on this afternoon. And then there's more. And I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this up to conclusion right now in a few moments. And I keep saying that, so you'll you'll learn that about me. 
it wasn't that we're just going to pray and all of our problems are going to magically disappear and the opposition to this vision is just going to all go away. It's not just we're going to pray right now and hope for the best. No, no. There's more here. Of course there is. And this is what Nehemiah says. He says, but we pray to our God, and because of them, the opposition, we set up a guard against them day and night. So we see in these next few verses that they prayed, and then what they do? Got back to work. Prayed and 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 got back to online. Help me. Work. He prayed and got back to work. He didn't ditch it and said, well, that can't be from God because, you know, we, we're, this is not easy. They prayed, which is the right primary first thing to do. But it's not the only thing. They got back to work. They got back to it. They got back to the thing that God called them to, which was fixing that which was broken. They got back to doing that thing that they knew that God asked them to do in the beginning. They prayed and they worked. They prayed and they worked. And they set up a guard. I love that stuff. If God gives you a vision, guard it. Guard it. That's another sermon. Can't go there. Don't have the time. So some of you probably noticed a pattern in this today. You're dealing with opposition in your life. to something you feel God's laid on your heart. You've dealt with the anger, the fury maybe. Uh, is furiosity a word? I just made that up this morning as I was rereading this sermon. Fury is kind of where we don't... Furiosity. I don't know. I kind of like it. Uh, look it up in the dictionary. If it's there, it's going to be great. If it's not, I made something up today new. It's called creativity or, or not. Furiosity. The mockery. The sarcasm. And because of that, you're crushed in spirit today. Because you just don't know what to do next. You just feel that you've probably not heard from God and it's time to give up. And you're discouraged. And you want to quit. If that's you today, I'm talking to you. If God is speaking to you, pray right now. Pray first. Then get back to doing the work God called you to do. Put a guard around what God's asked you to do. Because in my short time in ministry, 20-something years, there have been too many dreams and visions that I've seen planted in other people's lives that have been stifled because of fear, Anger, mockery, and sarcasm. They have no place in God's church. So don't let them kill your vision or your dream. Our God's bigger than all these things. Pray and don't quit. Pray and don't quit. And I love these couple of verses that are found shortly following this text, and I am going to end with these verses. I do promise you that. It says this, So the wall was completed on the 25th day of the month of Elo. In 52 days, when all of our enemies heard it and all the nations surrounding us saw it, they lost their confidence. For they recognized that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. So be prepared, friends. Opposition will always come against vision. Pray, get back to your calling. God's always been always is, and always will be greater than anger, mockery, sarcasm. With the help of our God, we build the walls. And all of God's people in the room and all across the internet world said, Amen. So Jesus, today, I pray that you would take uh, the words of this ancient text, and you would take, Lord, my thoughts about them, and as they travel from um, my mouth to people's ears in this room, online, Holy Spirit, I pray in the in-between that you would take these words and help them to land on people's hearts in a way that God wants them to land. So they would hear what God wants them to hear. And so, Lord, I pray you would do this now as we just uh, thank you for speaking to us and loving us and giving us walls to, to build and broken people to help and broken situations to step into and all these things in our lives Lord you've not called us to be inactive you've not called us to back down when opposition comes either if God be for us then who can be against us and so God today I pray for boldness and courage and faith and all these things that your people need to step up and step in and Lord in these days it seems even like the, 
The culture that we've been planted in, Lord, it seems like it's just a hard place to navigate anything when it comes to a, a vision that comes from God. But Lord, you've not stepped out of this culture today. You are ever present. The word of God tells us that, Lord, that you are so close to us today in 2021 in the midst of a global pandemic. You are so close to us that in us you live and you move and you have your very being through the people of God and the walls that you've called us to build and the people that you've called us to help. So Jesus, today I pray by a sovereign miracle of God, you would call someone back to their wall today. They've watched this, they've heard this, and God, they've been rebroken. <laughs> they've been rebroken. You just did a sovereign work. You spoke a miraculous word into their heart, gave them courage that only comes from you, God. So Lord, today we pray. The Spirit of God would submit everything done, said, sung, felt, heard, thought in this place and use it for the building of your kingdom amongst your people. I pray this in the strong, mighty, awesome, powerful name of Jesus. Amen.